this as Calimara, not Calamari. If you're new to the pond, go ahead and take a dive. You might like it here. And if you're coming back, I've got a special surprise for you. That's right, I'm creating my very own closed species. And if you want one of these cute little guys I'm designing today, you have to be subscribed to me. I know this isn't my usual style of video and heck that wasn't even my usual intro. But you know what? I feel like I've been in a rut lately and I thought it would be fun to do something completely different and kind of reinvent myself in a way. I wanted to broaden my content a bit so I thought it would be fun to do creature design for my channel mascot. And today I'll be explaining what these creatures are all about and showing you guys how to make your very own creatures. But only if you're subscribed to me, because all my subscribers get a complimentary little guy. I was initially calling them Calimaris, but that's also what I call my subscribers. And I've been feeling really weird lately about naming things after myself in general. So I really need to figure that out. But if you guys have any suggestions, feel free to comment down below because I read all my comments. I may not always reply to all of them, but I do read all of them. I just, uh, I'm shy like that. <laughs> but yeah, without further ado, let's dive right into it. But first, it's tablet review time! So you guys might be familiar with Gaomon, which has been a good partner of the channel and they've been sending me so many of my tools that I'm currently using and today they've sent me the Gaumon PD156 Pro. So what do I think of this particular tablet? Well I'm gonna be honest with you this is probably my favorite thing that they've sent me so far and I'm gonna tell you why. So this tablet is 15.6 inches, fully laminated, with 9 shortcut keys. But on top of that, they also support Windows Radial, which I didn't even know it was a thing until today. So sorry for all the Mac users out there. The box comes with a sleeve for the tablet, an adjustable stand, a pen and pen holder with extra pen nibs inside, and it also comes with drawing gloves and a wipe for the screen. The tablet came with the screen protector already applied, probably because they saw how much I struggled to put on the screen protector the first time, and the setup was super easy. I literally just got everything up and going in less than 10 minutes, and I am not the most tech savvy person. But the reason I really like this tablet is that it just feels really comfortable to use. I like that it has slightly rounded edges which make it comfortable for me to rest my arm on and the screen feels really nice when you're drawing on it. The size, it, it is a bit small for some people but because I'm pretty small for some people as well, it was really comfortable for me so that I'm not constantly reaching across. It was just the perfect size for me and the buttons worked great. They were super responsive, they didn't get stuck which was a problem I found with the previous products they sent me. The screen did take a bit of calibrating but it wasn't anything that the calibration feature couldn't fix. The pressure sensitivity was great. It has 8192 levels of pressure sensitivity so that really showed when I started drawing, but my only gripe is that the stabilization isn't very good. I notice a bit of pen jitter if I'm going too slow pulling lines, which is a bit of a shame. But for how inexpensive it is, I think it's actually really worth the price. It's also marketed to be portable and though it is really light and easy to carry around, I just can't see myself bringing it with me to like a coffee shop because it does need a power source and it still needs to be connected to your computer to actually function. But as an at-home drawing tool? Yeah, absolutely! If you guys are looking for an inexpensive tool that's really user-friendly, I highly recommend this one. So if you guys would like to get your hands on this product, Gaumon is having a 7-day promo deal for 15% off starting from the 28th of March until the 3rd of April. So before then, be sure to check out the links in my description.
When I first came up with the concept for these funky guys, I was heavily inspired by axolotls, ponies, koi fish, and to an extent, my husky laika. I love the idea of a semi-aquatic species because I've always been obsessed with water-based cryptids like lake monsters, krakens, and mermaids. And when I was little, I distinctly remember having imaginary friends that were like tiny mermaid horses that could also fly, and I had an empty fishbowl I kept just for them. So I think this is a direct incarnation of that. While I was drawing, I also couldn't help but be reminded of Toothless from How to Train Your Dragon because anything with those head frills will always remind me of him. And Mudkip. But okay, so what is this creature? They are a semi-aquatic animal that can live in fresh water or salt water. They prefer to eat fish, cephalopods, and shellfish, but they will also occasionally nibble on seaweed or seagrass. Because they're hunters, they have a mouth full of sharp teeth, which I based off dog teeth, and they move quickly through the water like dolphins, thanks to their webbed feet and powerful tails. As a cute touch, I gave them heart-shaped paw pads as well. Now, their tails are arguably the most important limb they have because they rely on it to propel them through the water. So, when you're designing your own creature, make sure that they have long, strong tails with sizable fins. They also have accessory fins on their sides and elbows. Some of them may even have fins on their back along their spine, which was inspired by the long, flowy fins of koi fish. The fins on their head, however, are the most important and must be present in all designs because they are also the creature's gills. I was debating on making their gills fluffy like axolotls, but I wasn't sure how to execute it. I still like the idea that they are fluffy though. But given that they're semi-aquatic, they also have a pair of functional lungs to help them breathe air when they're prancing about or basking on land, which is why they have nostrils. But these nostrils typically close up when they're underwater, similar to hippos. Basically, they work on mermaid rules. They can survive on land, but it's important for owners to prepare a pool for them and bring a spray bottle to keep them hydrated on walks. In the wild, they build their nests on land, usually close to shallow bodies of fresh water like ponds, which is an ideal place for them to raise their small pups. These creatures mate for life, and they can have about 3 to 4 pups in a litter. To make them even more bizarre, I decided that they are also ovoviviparous, which means they lay eggs and nurse their offspring, like a platypus. Can you tell that I used to be obsessed with animals? Another fun detail I added was that each individual has a unique eye shine when their pupils dilate, and their snouts were inspired by ball pythons because they have an adorable uwu face. They have skin similar to dolphins and orcas, and they come in a rainbow of colors and markings, fin shapes, and sizes. There's really no limit to how your creature can look, as long as you adhere to some rules to maintain consistency in the species. And I think that's a good transition into how you can make your own creature. As a note, because I get asked this a lot, I use Clip Studio Paint for all my drawings. You don't need to have CSP to make good quality drawings though. It's important to establish your basic skills first before investing in tools. And with that being said, let's discuss some of the rules on designing a creature like this. Number one is that they must be quadrupedal or quadrupedal. Uh, because I can't take another Fennekin or Litten situation. Number two is that their pelvis is situated slightly higher than their ribcage, giving them a bit of a sloped back, and because they primarily use their hind legs to push them through the water. They've got thick forelimbs that almost function like flippers underwater, and of course, webbed feet. The gill on the highest part of their head must stand upright and is considered the primary gill. Their tails must be the same length as their body, if not longer, depending on the breed. Their fins must always be translucent, so they aren't exactly flippers like dolphins or uh, whales or things like that. 
Their teeth should always be sharp because they're hunters and they need to be able to rip their prey to shreds. Other than that, everything else is fair game. Here are some design examples. Now, I imagine these creatures to essentially be excitable dogs. They're very social and playful and always full of energy. In the wild, they hunt and travel in packs with the strongest, oldest individual acting as the leader, often the matriarch or patriarch of the family. Their hunting techniques are similar to dolphins in that they will corral fish into a group and take turns snapping them up. The stronger individuals often keep watch for competitors like sharks, dolphins, or killer whales, and the faster individuals scout ahead to search for prey or identify danger. They also babysit, and pack members, both male and female, will look after each other's pups as a group. They aren't afraid of humans and are naturally curious creatures, which unfortunately meant a lot of them were killed and hunted because humans suck, but it also wasn't long before someone took one of them home and kept it as a pet. They can get a bit territorial when it comes to food and toys, but most of the time, they're mild-mannered creatures. They're also very vocal, and I imagine them sounding like huskies where they will scream and try to warble human words. They're also very intelligent in that they can be trained to do tricks, follow commands, or even work as service animals. Once humans started keeping them, they started breeding them for specific purposes. That's when different breeds started emerging. The first breed we have are the nobles. These guys were bred specifically for beauty and show. You can think of them as show dogs or show horses that were bred specifically to be put in shows and win a lot of trophies and are only bred with other champion show dogs. This breed has the longest, most extravagant fins that flare out when they're underwater and drape around their bodies like a satin cloak when they're on land. Their fins tend to have unique shapes that flow gracefully in the water, which isn't very functional, but it is very pretty. They usually also have additional accessory fins, such as around their nape or the base of their tails. Their snouts tend to be more slender, and their skin is adorned with intricate patterns or vibrant coloration. Their legs are longer and thinner than average, and their bodies are more defined with stronger silhouettes. You can say that they are the poster child of their species due to their visual appeal and thus are most often used in commercials, movies, and other forms of media. However, they are quite high maintenance, so they're really only kept by the upper class or very dedicated breeders. Personality-wise, nobles are pretty aloof. They're very calm and well-mannered. They aren't as hyper as other members of their species and that's partly because of their upbringing for show and their long flowy fins which make it difficult for them to move as quickly as other breeds. As a result, they are also very careful and care a lot about their grooming. So they don't do very well around small kids that like to grab and pull and make messes everywhere. The second breed we have are the Striders, and I actually lost the recording for this one somehow because I was sure I turned recording on, but when I finished and went to export it, it was gone. Oh well. The Striders are the racehorses of this close species. These guys were built for speed, so they are the sleekest and most slender of their kind. Their bodies are longer and they lack all accessory fins, which are replaced by a dorsal fin along their spine. Their front legs are thinner than their hind legs, which they use more frequently to kick through the water, and as a result, they possess wider, stronger hips that also help support their tail. Their snouts are also longer and thinner than other breeds. Inspired by bottlenose dolphins whose snouts help them cut through the water with more ease. Striders were built for function and like racehorses, people spend a lot of money raising, racing, and betting on them. I imagine their circuits can range from rivers to lakes to open seas and oceans and it's a huge spectacle to watch. Because of this, they are also the most high energy of all the breeds. 
they fall on the same level of prestige as the nobles, where only certain demographic of people tend to keep and raise them, but due to their sleek bodies and lack of any accessory fins, they are also a lot easier to keep, which makes them more accessible to a wider demographic of people. But due to their high energy levels and urge to run and swim, they tend to do better in wide open spaces as opposed to crowded cities. Striders are very excitable and are prone to zoomies, both on land and underwater. They're very intelligent, but are also willful and independent, which means they get into all sorts of trouble. If they want to get into your food, they will find a way to do it. And locked doors don't stay locked for long. They're very sassy and will often try to talk back to you if you tell them off. They comprehend a lot of human words, they just choose not to listen most of the time. The third breed we have are the Guardians. These guys are the big guns, both literally and figuratively. Similar to how dogs were bred for certain jobs, these guys were bred to work. They are the biggest breed and are pure muscle. They can guard, pull boats, nets and wagons, corral fish, fend off sharks, and give rides across bodies of water. These guys are tough. They can go the longest without water and their hides are thick to withstand injury. Their barks are also more akin to a bear roar, which makes them pretty intimidating. Unlike the other breeds, the Guardians were bred to be hostile. They are alert and territorial, and they lack the natural curiosity their species usually has. Instead, they're very suspicious creatures, hence they don't take kindly to strangers, but they are still social and enjoy the company of familiar humans and members of their species. They have a strong protective instinct and are very loyal, so they make great companions for people who live alone in rural areas. Their snouts are also the thickest, and that's because they bite the hardest too. They have the thickest, most powerful tails, which help them pull or carry heavy loads, but can also seriously injure someone with a single swing of it. They have the thickest limbs, and their muscles are well defined. However, they don't tend to have very flashy fins. They were built for function, after all. Their markings are going to be similar to working dogs like German Shepherds, Siberian Huskies, or Border Collies. The fourth and final breed are the Snugglers. Snugglers were bred to be family pets, so they are the friendliest, most social, affectionate, and gentle-natured of the species. Because of this, they're great with small children and other family pets. They have soft paws and small snouts, and they are the smallest of the different breeds, which allow them to fit into any household. These little guys just want all of your love, all of the time. They are often brightly colored and doe-eyed, which makes them very precious and irresistible beans. That's not even getting to their mules that are basically puppy whimpers. So yes, this breed is also known as the forever pup because they stay relatively small and retain a lot of the features of the pups of their species. They love to play, nap, and they're always curious about what you're doing, so they will try to include themselves in your activities. Because of that, they can get a bit clingy, so they don't tend to do very well on their own. So make sure they have a friend if you do want to keep one. Here are the size comparisons for your reference, and let me know which breed is your favorite. Of course, like any animal species, crossbreeding does happen. So if you want to make noble striders, guardian snugglers, or something else, definitely go for it. If you do end up making one for yourself, please tag me because I want to see the water babies you come up with. Hmm, water babies. That's definitely got a nice ring to it. Still, let me know your species name suggestions and comment down below. And remember, if you want to make one of these creatures, you have to be subscribed to me. That's the only payment that I ask for. So subscribe! Follow me on all my social media because I would love to promote your creations on my platforms. And check out my comic because that will make me really happy and I will see you guys in the next video.
Goodbye!